All righty, let's see if we have sound. Hello, everyone. It is that time again, time for a live stream. Let me refresh my screen, which is out of the frame. That looks pretty good. And I want to welcome you guys to our final live stream of, well, no, it's a new month. I was going to say of the month. <laughs> but we are on a new day. So new month, September, Macna month. This is the month I promote Macna the most. And uh, I'm going to try to rein it in. But I'm very excited because it happens this next weekend. I leave town um, Wednesday, and my reef has to stay alive the entire time I'm gone. And I hope it will. I've got a tank sitter lined up already. And uh, that will be from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Las Vegas. So I'm hoping you're going to go, especially if you're a local person. You're like, yeah, I could really, I could just drive up there. Just do it. Just go and have a great time. So let me make sure I get this all set up correctly so I can see you guys. All right, good. We have sound. Nice. Uh, yeah, the tank is not blued out right now because this is a 10K light, or it should be. Eh, it's 10 in the back. It's it's 20k in the front all right so today's topic is about new things <clears throat> and i wanted to just kind of go through a, a few things that have come across my radar recently that um and there's gonna be more this next weekend obviously because a lot of people like to reveal their products but because i came back from aquashella in chicago i got to see a few things now i had a few things uh I've had things handed to me saying, hey, talk about this or review it. <laughs> so today's live stream is going to be about that kind of stuff. So without further ado, <clears throat> let's talk about this little guy here. So this is called a Pod Hotel, if I remember. Yeah, exactly. Pod Hotel. And it's made by uh, Divine Aquatic Supply. And what it is, is it's an acrylic container that is filled up with coroplast material, filled with tiny holes, so your pods can live within it. And uh, you take this guy and you put it down inside your refugium or down inside your tank and you shake it out really good to get every drop of air out of it so that way it's completely filled with water. And the idea is that pods will live and breed within these tiny little holes safe from the mouths of your fish. And yet certain fish like mandarins, copper band butterflies and such, could then approach it and basically siphon out the guys that get near the edge. And so it's kind of a neat little product. I actually don't know what it costs because it was just handed to me. I'm going to pretend it, I, I just don't know. I don't know what it's going to cost. Um, but it's actually been something in development now for about a year and a half, two years. They've been testing it for some time. And they asked me to throw one in my tank, which I've not done yet, but I'm going to. And I want to show it to you while it's nice and clean. <laughs> of course, over time, it'll get covered with coralline, uh, algae. You can, of course, brush it off to make it look cleaner if it's bothering you. If you have a cleanup crew, it'll eat the algae off of it anyway, which is important. But having everything living inside these tiny little holes along here and, you know, there. And there's even holes this way, so they can work their way up floor to floor to floor, like an apartment complex, if you think of it that way. There's four different holes. And so everything can migrate. And it's a good way to create a spot that's safe. Let me tell you what we used to do 20 years ago. Uh, we didn't have pod hotels. <laughs> We had the basket you would buy strawberries in, and uh, we would just take that thing, and we would you know rinse it off really quick after you know we've eaten our strawberries. We would fill it up with rock rubble, and we turn it upside down and stick it in the corner of the tank. And you saw this basket sitting in the corner. It wasn't really appealing, but it was a great way for pods to breed in safety. And then of course, if anything uh, emerged from it, it would be consumed by the fish, uh, certain fish, you know, the predators like uh, wrasses and mandarins and uh, yeah, you know, like I said before, uh, butterflies. So this is a cool little thing that I think would fit inside pretty much anyone's tank. It could work in the back of a nano. It could work in the in the refugium itself. It can work in the back of your reef. It can be down under the rock work. Just a nice little place for critters to live. So the name of the company, Divine Aquatic Supply. Then I want to talk about, this isn't really new. This actually came out a while ago, um, less than a year ago. It's a, a reef food by Benepets. And so my buddy, Dwayne, who you guys have met through my channel, he uh, overused this like crazy in his tank. I mean, like he was using it every day, just putting heaping spoonfuls of this stuff into his tank, you know, way too much, read the instructions wrong and went crazy. 
and didn't have any cyano outbreaks, didn't have any algae outbreaks, didn't ha nothing bad happened, and so he loves it. And uh, I mean, that's not exactly a great way to test a food product to like dump the entire thing in your tank, but that's basically what he did. So this stuff here is a powder, very, very fine powder. Let's see if I can turn that towards you without spilling it all over the, uh, the floor. And you mix it up with some tank water and let it sit for about five minutes because there's actually bacteria in here as well that will then come to life. And uh, it's got probiotics, it's got a lot of different ingredients. It doesn't really have a smell. And, uh, you know, it's, well, I mean, I guess if it had to compare it to anything, it smells like hay. <laughs> and uh, so I've been using my tank now for the last week or two. I put it in about once, maybe twice a week. And what I do is I, you know, big tank, I take a tablespoon and I mix it up with some tank water, stir it up, let it sit for about five minutes while my frozen food is thawing. And then I go ahead and I pour it into my tank, into the anemone cube, into the frag system. I'm just giving some to all of it. And uh, it, it's a great filter feeder food that disperses everywhere. And what you can do is you can disable your skimmer for 15 minutes or an hour, whatever you prefer, and then you know resume everything. It doesn't make your skimmer shut down. It's not doing anything odd. I'm not weird, dealing with all kinds of horrible outbreaks in my sand bed, anything like that. So if you're looking for a food and you're coming to Macna, this is something you might want to pick up for your own tank. And then this one here is from uh, JQ's Reef Shack, and it says on the box, make sure I said it right, make aquariums great again. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you the wrong thing. <laughs> so um, what this is, is a coral carrier. And you've probably seen some already. Well, these are being made with a 3D printer. So you've got your container that should hold the water. And then you've got your little coral carrier right here. And the entire thing was 3D printed. So I'm gonna hold this up a little closer so you can see it. And it's got this, this base on the bottom where it, you know, it like sits like this inside the container. And I asked, well, why did you make this so large? Why didn't you just put like four legs or something? And he said, some people have asked to be able to put a little bit of carbon, like in a pouch in the base of this. So when it's transporting, it's absorbing some of the, the crap in the water. I thought, oh, that's kind of a good idea. And it's got these little rubber inserts inside each hole. So when you put the frag plug in place, it holds it securely. And he even 3D printed the screws that holds it together. <laughs> and he's got his logo on the top, Reef Shack. So I th and this comes in three different colors. On his website, they are gonna be 25 bucks. If you wanted to get it from Amazon, I believe it's 30. So that's JQ's Reef Shack, and you can look for that logo right there. So that's a new thing. Uh, like I said, it comes in three different colors. So you can pick the one you like. And then this is a coral dip that I got last weekend, or two weekends ago at Aquashella. It's called Zero Dip. And uh, what do I, it smells like something I recognize but I'm not positive what's in it. And it's used to kill the pests on your corals and you would just put a few squirts into your small container of water, dip your coral in it for 10, 15 minutes. All the instructions are on here. It says uh, use four pumps of this liquid in a gallon of water and do not dip everything more than 20 minutes. So this is a new product from, uh, uh, why do I never remember the name? Aquatech. And that just came out. So this will be actually revealed at Macna uh, this week. So if you're hoping to find out more about it, you can definitely find them at Aquatech's booth and learn more about it. I'm going to be trying it out as soon as I get something new for my tank. It's obviously just for corals. It's not for fish. And uh, the smell kind of reminds me of tea tree oil, but there's a series of different oils in there. So that is something to look forward to. What else do I got for you? Okay, so I'm wearing this shirt, which is the Reef Shine guys. They were at Aquashella, and they actually made their own moonshine. <laughs> so a lot of people were trying it. And believe it or not, with all the time I was there, I never got a single sip. I believe they had an apple pie moonshine, and uh, there were some other flavors, and I just never got around to their booth. And by the time I did, the booth was shut down, and I missed my opportunity. So, But I did get the shirt. Actually, they told me, you got to wear the shirt on YouTube. So here I am doing just that. The group on Facebook... Um, 
Club Milo's Reef is doing really well. We're coming up on 1,500 members. We've only been in existence for about three weeks, and we're only 1,500 good members, <laughs> which means we don't have anyone on there being aggressive or angry or passive aggressive. Uh, you know, no one's putting each other down because we're not allowing it. It's not a selling group. You're not going to find things there to purchase. You're not going to be able to sell the things you want to sell. Um, we're there to help you with your reef tank and, and also to let you show it off. You can show us what's going on with your tank. You can ask us about your fish. You can tell us about a product you're trying out. That's what the group is for. It's just everyone that's nice is in this group. And so uh, you're, of course, welcome to join. I just added another 18 people this morning. Uh, I'm the one that approves all the people that get added. And I have um, five or six moderators that help to keep the peace. If, but really, it's been a really smooth sailing situation. And this week, we're about to have a contest, and I'm telling you about it on YouTube first, before the group even hears it. And that is that Kohler Filtration is donating three items that um, will be available as a prize to one lucky person. So if you haven't joined the group yet, be sure to join, and then make sure that you participate in that thread that will be posted. There will be a picture of the product, and it will say, here's the contest, and it's not going to be hard. You can do a search for the word contest, and boom, you'll probably find it pretty quick, because this is our first one. And you'll, be a, you'll get a chance to win some uh, GFO, some carbon, and I think bio pellets are the three things they're giving away. So that is coming up, and uh, it's really easy to enter. I mean, basically, you just have to kind of like, well, I'm sure it'll be things like, like their page, and uh, comment below, and then we will use a randomizer to pick the winner. And it has to be someone in the United States or in Canada. And that's not to exclude you guys in Brazil, because I know Brazil loves this channel. It's because I asked them, is this worldwide? And they told me those are the two countries. So that was their choice, not mine. So that is coming up. All right, let me have a cup of coffee here. In personal news, I am up five pounds, which means I have five pounds over my Macna weight, and I have to be at Macna in a few days, and I want to be down. So I think I'm just going to drink coffee for four days. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, don't, I don't worry about it that much. I just got on the scale today and was like, ah, really? But you know what? It's actually totally deserved. I went to the supermarket recently and I bought all the carbs I could probably get in my cart. And I looked down at it and there was nothing healthy. I was like, wow. I mean, literally, I just bought all the crap food I could imagine. I don't know what was going through my head. I did not go there hungry. I just wanted this and I wanted that and I wanted this and I bought it all and I've been eating it. So it's my own darn fault. We're going to talk about water testing. Uh, today is Saturday. It's water test day. I always recommend that to you guys. I recommend you do it every single week. If you're lazy or if you're feeling um, discouraged with your tank, please test your tank. Because if you don't know what the water quality is of your tank, how are you going to solve whatever's going on in your tank that is upsetting you? So pull out your test kits. Make your measurements. I uh, try to test every single Saturday. And I started this thing about six months ago where I called it Water Test Saturday. And the reason I did that was to remind myself to do it. Because I have been doing this for a very long time and it's very easy for me to just look at the reef and say, everything's fine. I'm not going to test this week. I'll do it in a few days and it ends up being a few weeks. And then things are out of whack and I have to spend all this time and effort trying to correct. So please test your water today and uh, feel free to post results. I recommend Instagram. A lot of you are on there. And if you're not doing that, then inside Club Me Loves Reef on Facebook. So I should have, and I will put the link in the description of this video later, but it's just facebook.com slash groups slash Me Loves Reef. Anytime you're trying to find me anywhere on social media, just look for Me Loves Reef. It's all one word. And, uh, okay, so here are my parameters, and it's a little interesting. My uh, alkalinity is up. It's up at 11 dKH, which I'm fine at number. I kind of like 10 but it's up at 11 right now, so I adjusted my calcium reactor slightly to help it not dissolve as much media, which will in turn uh, raise the pH in the reactor, which means less alkalinity will be coming out of the reactor, which will let the alkalinity come down in the tank. So I'm sure you're thinking, what is he talking about? Just think of it as this way. If you're dosing alkalinity with a dosing pump, you're dosing less. That's my goal. Uh, okay. Phosphates surprisingly jumped up quite a bit again. And I had just been talking about that for the last couple of weeks, that it was crazy low. I mean, you know, for my tank, it was around 0.05, two weeks in a row. 
and today it's 0.25. So I think everything's back to normal. This is not something you can see now, but I will take a good picture of it later and share it on social media. Um, I had this weird bacteria growing in my refugium, somewhat in the sump. It appeared in, on this coral uh, in like stringy stuff and inside some of the power heads. And I thought, well, that's a problem. So I stopped dosing vodka. And as soon as I stopped, it like pretty much all evaporated from the system. All this weird stringy stuff just went away, except for this little spot right here is obvious and inside a Vortec pump I'm cleaning today. But uh, interestingly that the phosphate went up so quickly uh, since stopping the dosing of the vodka. But I chose to stop it because my nitrates were not coming down and that leads me to nitrates. So nitrates are still off the chart. And when I say chart uh, on my ELO test kit, it only goes to 25 and it's higher than 25. Um, Odds are it is around 40 still. It seems to stay around 40. My tank seems to like that number no matter what I throw at it. And uh, it just is what it is. I mean, it'd be nice to have a lower number, but my reef is happy and colorful and beautiful. And so for me to hit some arbitrary number just because I want it almost seems counterintuitive. Why mess with success? But um, for those of you that have zero nitrate, kudos, number one. And number two, you shouldn't be at zero. You should be around two to three ppm. And if your tank is at zero, if your phosphate's at zero, you need a little bit more nutrients in your tank. And believe it or not, there are people out there that are dosing nitrate and they're dosing phosphate into their tank to bring that number up a little bit because it's too low. And usually when it's too low like that, it leads to other problems like dinoflagellates, um, which is a horrible algae you do not want, or a bacteria you do not want growing in your tank. Uh, I, th I think of it like an algae, but it's not. It's bacteria and it's horrible. It's really hard to get rid of. There's been a lot of different methods used and it's one of the worst situations that can pop up in a tank that oftentimes makes people leave the hobby. All right, um, pH was 8.36 or 8.4 last night. Temperature was 79.5 last night. Uh, ORP was down below 300, which is kind of low for my tank, but the probe is old and I never clean it, so it might be around 325 or so. Um, if I were dosing ozone, which I don't, I would be able to hit a number that's more around 375. Um, so I'm showing myself a whole hundred below, but this is not a number I track, and if I were looking at the graph, it kind of does this all the time. It's the same number, so it's whatever. Calcium is 425, which is fine. Magnesium is 1350, which is great. And... Uh, that was everything. So today, I have to test my frag tank and go through all the barrage of tests and see how it's doing. Last time I checked it, it matched the reef, which means at this point, I could go on my reef, I could snip a few frags, I could glue them to some frag plugs, and I could stick them in the frag system, and they would do great because the waters were pretty much essentially the same. But if I do not have the same water, then the coral being cut and then handled and glued and moved could stress it out to where it sits or stagnant instead of thriving. So having the waters matching each other is of course ideal to where I can just move things over since they are separate tanks and they're not tied together. All right, so I've been ignoring you guys. I'm gonna turn the camera slightly here and see if we can get the anemone cube. Oh, not that one, this one. And All right, guys, um, I pretty much covered everything I want to talk about today. <laughs> and we're done. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I have a really cool idea that I'm hoping to do with our live stream in the future. And what I would like to accomplish is hit two audiences at once. Because I've got the one group of people that want the content and they want it in like 8 to 12 minutes. And then I've got the other group of you people that likes to hang out and hear the conversation and let it flow wherever it goes. And you know that tends to run us 45 minutes to an hour. And it's a little bit of a rambling situation and I'm addressing questions on the fly and you, know, you guys are throwing everything at me and I'm doing my best to fill in those answers. What I would love to accomplish, and the technology is getting closer and closer to it. I don't know if my channel qualifies for it, but YouTube offer is offering a new thing called Premiere. And if I have the right hardware, and if my channel uh, qualifies, the idea would be that we would uh, premiere a video together, basically at two o'clock, 
there'd be a countdown and then a video starts and we all watch it together. Me too. <laughs> I would make the video in advance and then we would watch it together and I believe a live chat would occur to where you could actually comment with each other about what's happening during the actual film portion that we're watching together. And then when it ends, we would then continue into a live stream to discuss what we just watched. And I think that would be great because those that want to catch the main point and watch, you know, let's say I was doing a thing about octopus and I wanted to go into their needs and, and uh, their traits and the things to watch out for. And I just covered that. And then, you know, after that, we went into a QA and a and then we talked about other things. That would be the best of both worlds because we'd be able to just flow from one type of content right into the other and give people what they really, you know, give both people what they like. And I think that'd be pretty exciting. But will that happen? I don't know. It's, I guess I could say, just keep watching and, you know, maybe this time next year, that's exactly how it works. Maybe it'll be sooner. I have to do some more research. I have to get a better encoding uh, machine for these live streams so that you get the, get the good quality too. So, all right. <laughs> Mateus asked the question, can you give us your take on aquascaping? That's a great question. When it comes to aquascaping, a large tank or a smaller tank or a pico tank, one of the first things you want to do is stack it in a way, you know, stack the rocks within or use structures within that do not look man-made. And it's so easy to do that pile of rocks or stack it where it looks like bricks, like a brick wall. We don't want to do that. And we, of course, want a flat spot to put corals on. But at the same time, nature hates a straight line. That is absolutely unnatural. And so... We want shelves, but we want to have caves. We want to have swim throughs for the fish to go through. We want to have a high place and a low place. We want to basically create something that looks like you swam up to it in the ocean and that's awesome and you just investigate it, but visually, you know, you don't actually touch it. And if we can create something that looks 100% natural and does not look like a pile of rocks like a Boy Scout might do to mark a spot where a campfire could be. <laughs> that would be best. And sometimes we put in too much rock and it's, it's less of a problem these days. In the, uh, you know, 10 years ago, people would put rocks all the way up to the top of the back of the tank, even had the rock come out the top. And they did that because they wanted to put all the corals there and then they wanted to look at it from the front and you just saw this wall of rock with corals. But it really looked bad. I mean, it just looked like a pile of rocks and it, you didn't have any depth perception. You just saw a rock going all the way up the tank. It was kind of hideous. So my friend, Scott Fellman, he walked, he went around the nation with a talk, tear down the wall. And you know, he, of course he was doing a, uh, a reference to tearing down the wall uh, between East and West Berlin, you know, which is a historical moment. But it was great to mention the same thing for us as reef keepers. We don't need a wall. We want to have less of a wall and more of a natural look. And if you can aquascape a tank to where all your rock is only halfway up and then you have room for the corals to grow upward, that open area on the top is also for the fish to swim, which I think looks beautiful, especially when they're all up there actively. And there are going to be certain fish that dither or swim along the top, and there's going to be some that stay close to the rock work for protection, for guarding their home, for they just they feel more comfortable down there. Um, Antheus and Chromis, they like to be up high and they like to swim around and look for food constantly. If you can, if you have the space to have a tank that's wide, I mean, this tank here is three feet wide. And when you look at my tank from the front, people say, what size is this tank? And I tell them 400 feet, uh, <laughs> 400 gallons. They say, oh, I thought, I thought this tank would be bigger. And the reason they're saying that, and you have the perfect view right now, is because my rock work is in the middle of my tank. If I had taken all my rock work and pushed it to the back from the front, this tank would look a lot larger because everything would be pushed back and there would be more of that sandy open area in the front. But I wanted to make it more peninsula style and I can watch the tank from this side, from this side, and of course from the main viewing panel. So I did not want the rock to touch the glass. 
Sometimes you have to install your rock work in a way where it's leaning against one wall of the tank so it doesn't fall over. But if you have your rock come too close to the glass, then you won't be able to use your cleaning magnet to clean the glass. And you see, that's a problem. We want to have plenty of room to keep the glass clean so we can enjoy the livestock inside. And it's really important to make sure there's at least enough space for the cleaning magnet to move. And then if you have corals growing near the edge, are they going to grow toward the magnet where you can't use your magnet anymore? And sometimes, especially lazy hobbyists, um, and you know, I've been one of them in the past. Matter of fact, I am one right now. Down here in the bottom, you can almost see it in the frame. I have a Montipora that is growing up here and it's grown up the front of the glass, which is a terrible thing to do. Number one, it's not pretty where it's glued to the glass. It just looks like white uh, porcelain. And I had it growing here on this glass and this glass is forever messed up in this bottom corner. It doesn't matter how much I clean it and scrape it. I've tried razor blades, everything. There's like this weird cloudy situation. I don't know what caused it, but it's like the Montipora and the glass merged and it literally seems to be in the glass. I can't seem to get that spot crystal clear like it's supposed to be. And I, I would love to just go in there with something and sand it, but I don't know what to use. <laughs> uh, if you're a glass expert and you know something I don't know, please tell me. I would love that. I'd like to get this corner cleaned up if at all possible because it is kind of ruining my view. But back to aquascaping, when you have corals that grow too close to the glass and you can't use your magnet, and then it keeps growing and it grows on the glass, and now you're cleaning around that subject, that's no good either. And so that can be really discouraging. Um, and then eventually you're like, okay, God, I got to clean it up. And you go and you break the stuff off and you really clean it. And suddenly you have this great view again. And you're like, oh, that's so much nicer. And yet you might have, like I said, it may have messed up the glass a little bit. So keep that in mind when you're aquascaping. Um, one of the things that would be really smart is to secure the rocks to each other. At the very least, secure the foundation. <clears throat> if the rocks can move, then everything above it can tumble. And I'm not saying the rock itself will move, but livestock will move that rock for you. Whether it is a cucumber or a, a sand sifting goby, um, a sand sifting starfish, even the serious is tunneling around in the sand. Those all could unearth some sand to where the rock could start to shift. And then if your tank is using pumps that creates that wave action constantly, even that wave action nonstop could eventually affect how that rock is sitting. So in my reef, I've got an acrylic support system underneath all the bottom rock in this tank all the way across. So technically I could take a shop vac or something and I could suck out all the gravel out of this tank and none of my rock work would move because my foundation is a whole series of acrylic supports. And I have an article about it. It took all day long to do when I was first setting up the tank. And I have to admit, I, even I was getting frustrated with it near the end. I was like, I just want to be done. But I knew I was doing something really smart. It just sucked. It was such a process because I didn't just have a piece of acrylic with some legs sticking up. I had to make sure every leg went to the right height. So like we have this weird piece of rock. Think of it like an asteroid. You got this weird rock. And I needed a post that was really tall and really wide up here. I needed a couple small ones. So it's a three point support system under each foundation rock. And I had to make sure each piece was the right height, glue it in place, set the rock on there, make sure all the rocks touched the way I wanted it to. Took forever. <clears throat> I had a friend over here that helped me and you know he was very supportive and you know he tolerated my insanity. But I mean, here we are years later and you don't ever hear, oh no, my rocks tumbled and everything got messed up because I made that bottom foundation so solid. Then as you work your way up with the rocks, you can use putties or two peak, two-part concrete to bond it together before you add your salt water, or you can uh, just set it on top and pray. <laughs> as long as the foundation isn't moving, everything above should pretty much stay, but it's really best to, con to <clears throat> build it into a solid piece if you can. My friend Ryan uh, actually made pillars, and he took a, a hole saw and drilled through the center of rock, 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 and then he made a support with a PVC pipe, and he set each rock down like a donut on top and on top and on top. And he made these pillars that the fish can swim through. And it's really cool looking. And uh, again, that was one of those things where you're working in advance to make sure you have something that's amazing. Another method might be if you wanted to make an archway and you could use rock and zip ties to tie it to this PVC pipe or a PEX pipe or something that's you know reef safe, uh, acrylic rod, um, anything like that, that you can then 
hide with material so that you don't see the man-made thing in the middle. That would be best. Techno Kid, thanks for the love. All right, let's see. I have not been looking at the chat because I've been answering Matthias's question. And, oh, let me talk about this really quick. Last week, after I was done with the chat, I went through and I found questions that I did not answer that I felt deserved an answer. And I made a video answering those four or five questions and stuck it on the Facebook page on, in the group. So if you're not following me, Loves Reef, on Facebook, please do, because I think that's what I want to start doing. It's, you know, I, I love to respond to you guys on the fly, but sometimes stuff gets past me or I start getting long-winded. <laughs> and I didn't get a chance to answer your questions. So I actually took the screenshot, I built a video, and I uploaded it. I'm going to do the same thing today. Anything that I missed in here that I think was a good one, uh, I will address it, and I'll upload it to Facebook. So you have a second video coming up. And it won't be a stream. It'll actually be a nicely edited video. So hopefully you'll like it. It gets to the point, get the answer to the question, and we move forward. So look for the one from last week. It won't be hard to find. It's not like I upload tons of videos there. And, uh, of course, that page is full of cool things I share. I uh, just shared a uh, video about... Uh, what was the terminology? It was something to do with fish being self-aware. That's what it was. And very interesting. And to be, and I, I kind of read it, and I didn't really get it until I watched the video in the article where it showed a dolphin that was looking in a mirror at itself, and it was actually checking its body out. <laughs> and that was proof that this animal was self-aware. It was actually checking its stomach, and it was checking its its fins, and it would do things with its you know, front fins, uh, the pectoral fins. And it was really interesting because it normally can't see those areas on itself, and so it was inspecting itself in a mirror, and that is how they were saying, scientifically saying it was self-aware. And that's kind of interesting, and uh, they did it with some fish, and you can uh, read the article, watch the videos. That was one thing I shared, and I, I pretty much share something on that page every single day, so you don't want to miss out on that. Uh, hang on. Look, no one's asking questions. That's perfect. I, ha I don't have to answer any. <laughs> uh, as you see, the lights are changing behind me. I had it, uh, it, it's all automated. It turns itself on and off. And uh, this one over here is lit with a radion, so it's on its own schedule. Right now it's in the blue coloration, but then it'll switch to the more white coloration, like sunlight. And then, of course, as it heads into the night, it'll be blue again. So right now it looks kind of blue to you guys. Uh, this, this tank gets a lot of love from people on YouTube. Uh, they, a lot of people have told me the reason I set up an anemone cube was because you did it, Mark. Or they said, I watched this video and I had to set up a saltwater tank myself. And, you know, I'm glad that this uh, tank has inspired you guys. For me, I just wanted a small tank I could enjoy from the kitchen, which I do. And I wanted a spot for all these anemones. And that was my goal, to keep anemones out of the main tank. And then I ended up putting in that giant sea bay. That, that's all sea bay right there. That whole thing. Now remember, this is 36 wide. And you could say about 24 of it is the sea bay anemone. And it's not even stretched out. It's early in the day. The light's only been on an hour and a half. So that is quite a lot of uh, sea bay. I'll get you a little closer. We'll see if that is viewable. Oops. You can see all my lights on the ceiling there. I'm trying to light myself here. And there's Spock. Hi, Spock. <laughs> Sean says hi, too. <laughs> uh, this right here is the Gorgonian that came from the 20,000-gallon reef in Long Island. Over here are hammer corals that I talked about recently. You can see some skunk clownfish right down here at the bottom. Okay, that's a good one. Um, I just saw someone mention something I want to talk about. I want to get into corals. My BTA has split 30 times. What coral should I keep with a BTA that will not kill it? All right, let's get into that. I'm going to steal the camera again. I know you were in love with it, but I'm sorry, I gotta get in the frame. This is an important conversation. So I'm gonna do this. If your BTAs are splitting like crazy, your water quality is not good. And it is not normal for bubble tip anemones to split and split and split and split. And I had a friend who I sent one of my rose anemones to, 
And he easily grew like 30 or 40 of them, and he was selling them left and right. And he said, it won't stop, it won't stop. And I told him, I said, look, you, gotta, you have to get your water quality in check. This is a big problem, and your anemones are doing it because they're stressed. You are doing something, you're changing something, you're creating some kind of a situation that is making these anemones split because they're in a panic and self-preservation mode, and their design is it that if things are going wrong, tear yourself in half so one half of you can live. <laughs> and that's the reality. That is the reality of bubble tip anemones. They don't just naturally split. I've got some anemones down here. I'm gonna change this camera again for you guys. I'm gonna tilt this down. So this anemone right here in the front that has a purple foot right here. This is the first anemone I got in 2003. And there are three others from that original one in this tank. This is one right here, actually. One, two, three, and there's one around the corner, four. Those same four bubble tips have been in this tank for whatever it is, three, four years, and there hasn't been another clone. Zero clones whatsoever. The roses, they have split a few times, and I've sold a couple of them to some people over the last, you know, I sell like one, or maybe two a year. They tend to split because they have no space and they want to make more of themselves and put themselves somewhere, but it's not a stress situation. Typically, if you take an anemone and you cut it or you tear it, it will split. If you change the water parameter significantly, like the water temperature is crazy different, the alkalinity is way off. Uh, salinity drops and rises really fast. You do a heavy feeding and you do a water change, it will shock them and they could split. So you do want to avoid doing things that are going to cause that kind of chaos in the water. If your water temperature, your salinity, and your pH all match, your anemones won't keep splitting on you. And even in here, You've got a couple of these little green guys on the back glass that you can probably make out sort of here. There's one right there, there's one there, there's a couple over here. Let me get you a little bit closer, but it's still very, very blue. Hang on a second. Adjust this here like that, lower this. I think you can make that up. You know what? I got another product we can talk about. One second. So we've got a filter on here. Let's see if we can try this real quick. Not in love with it, but you know what? That's, you see it a little bit better there. Um, this one right here is a green bubble tip. There's a little green bubble tip back there, and there's two along the top. Those little guys are nano anemones. They never get much larger than this one up here at the top, which is about three inches in diameter, maybe. And I'm talking about full old tentacles. The core of it's about two, and of course the trunk of it's like one inch. And then I've got a whole bunch of them right here. That's the same bunch that are always here. There's never more of them. There's never less of them. It's the same amount all the time. Occasionally I can reach in and I can just lift one off the rock because they're so easy to share with other people. But if your tank, I gotta take this filter back off. If your tank has swing parameters, you're gonna have a lot of splitting stuff. Okay. I'm gonna talk about that one more product I told you about. So I got, oh man, where's the box? So this is the Coral Viewer from Polyp Labs. And I saw an example of this on Instagram. I got really excited. So I went ahead to, uh, I went with the goal to find it when I went to Aquashella. And there have been different versions of these clips in the past. Uh, I remember one came out a long time ago, <clears throat> and it was on um, maybe Amazon or somewhere. And then Algae Barn came out with one, and basically it's this clip that just squeezes onto your phone, fits around the lens of the camera, and it had a filter on the front, but I didn't really like the color. And I'm not trying to bash Algae Barn. I just, that one did not impress me, and I have one. I paid for it. Then this came out, and people kept talking about different filters. I'm like, wait, what are we talking about here? Because now you've got my interest. So here is one filter that actually is an orange gel, and you can just screw it right onto this. And it says on the side that it's a 15,000 Kelvin lens. 
Now, you want to be very careful to screw it on. I mean, fortunately, you don't, you don't have to like mess with it all the time, but you want to make sure you thread it on correctly because it's metal into plastic and you want to strip it. And it even comes with a little tiny lens cap. So you can put that on there to keep it safe and sound when you stick it in your pocket. So that's nice. And then they have another filter. This is the uh, 10, no, the 20,000 Kelvin. Now you can stack the filters on top of each other. And now you're looking through two colors at once and that really filters out the blue and you get a really nice effect. And there's still one more thing, but wait, there's more. <laughs> this is the third one. And this filter is a little magnifying glass. And what it does, exactly what I said, it magnifies things. So you've got this kind of fisheye lens a little bit. It's not fisheye, but you know, it's just bulged out a little bit because it's a magnifying lens. And you could even put that on the front. And now you've got all three stacked on there at once and stick this on your phone. And if you're trying to take a picture of something up close, this magnifying glass is great for it. If it's further back, it's not gonna help you and just remove it and only use the filter. This product, uh, this whole kit was $35, and I really like it. Now, there's been some comments on, you know, when I first posted about it on Instagram and on Facebook. Someone said there's another version out. I think it's by Dell Tech. And people are like, oh, it's even better than this one. Well, I'll find out when I'm at Macna. But so far, I'm really impressed with this one. I want to tell you guys because I want you to post pictures that aren't crazy blue. I want you to post pictures of things that look pretty. And so if you can get yourself this coral viewer or maybe the better one <laughs> so that your pictures look better that would be ideal because the uh you've got the blue and then you've got the filtered and it just looks so much better and i've shared pictures online already so if you haven't seen them yet go to my instagram or go to uh my facebook on milo's reef and you will find the uh the examples of what i did and i'll keep using it i used it just recently and you can shoot video through it and you can shoot pictures through it so an awesome little pro uh item. I'm glad that I thought of that one as part of this segment since we're talking about new products. By the way, using that magnifying glass would be good if you're trying to identify a pest because you can uh, take a really good picture of it through that lens and then you can zoom in on it on your phone. Let's see if there's any other questions I can answer. I don't see any more questions. Am I missing questions? Some of you guys are talking to each other. Thank you for doing answers, people, for providing answers. All right, we'll give it a couple more minutes. We still have about 10 minutes left on this live stream. Can I show the lens against the camera? Well, we're filming the camera, but you know me and my backups. I have an extra iPhone. So we'll take this off the case because I don't think the case is necessary. I haven't used this phone in a while, so it's dead. But you can just clip it right onto your phone, right over the camera, so that it's not covering. Actually, it would work either way. That's kind of nice. So here it is on a phone. This is an iPhone 7 Plus, I think. And it just fits right on there. And the way it's cut out on the inside, which I don't know if you can see it, but there's like three holes. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe you can get some more light through it. Uh, there's three holes because of the multi, this is the original single cam. The newer iPhones have the triple cam or the double cam. Uh, one thing you want to avoid when you're doing picture taking with your smartphone device, especially with filters, disable your flash because invariably the flash will come on because it's not getting as much light and, and it's just a garbage picture. So remember to turn off your flash. But other than that, it just fits right on there and it's super easy to use and keep handy. And I love, like I said, that it has the cute little lens cap <laughs> that you can just snap on there and keep everything nice and clean when you shove this in your pocket. So I think it's pretty cool. And yeah, it's working fine on my iPhone 10 and it fits on these older phones as well. Uh, 
Um, Power Slayer says, Mark, any suggestions for minor element dosing? Not looking for an hour answer, just a few seconds. Uh, minor dosing. The only thing that I could think of that you would want to dose occasionally uh, would be iodine. And I like using Lugol solution, which is a very concentrated iodine. And you just put in one drop per 50 gallons. And if your tank is even smaller, you're going to need to divide that one drop in half. And the easiest way to do that is to uh, dilute it with some RODI water. So it'll be a little tricky, but you could take a vial of like five milliliters of water, add a drop, shake it up, and then pour two and a half of that water into your tank. And that was enough for 25 gallons. Man, that was good math on live stream. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> uh, I don't really dose anything else. Uh, you know, the strontium, the molybdenum, I can't even say that word. I always just spit it out really quick because I know I'm saying it wrong. And occasionally when someone says it right, I'm so impressed. Uh, those things, I don't even dose them. Uh, I know they've been around forever. You know, Kent sold them in bottles. Uh, Continuum sells them. Everyone sells them, but I don't use them. Alexander, who is tuned in from Norway, thank you so much for watching the live stream. I, I love how you guys are you're like, I finally made the live stream uh, because it's always available. It's just you may not be in the live chat situation. But other than that, the content I'm sharing, it's for all of you around the world, no matter what the clock is. But if you tune in at the time it's happening, it's always exciting. It says right now, this moment, there's 134 of you on here at the same time, which is pretty cool. And uh, we've been doing live streams now, I mean, I'd say almost a year. Oh, okay, so let me ask you guys something. I actually need you to comment. Matter of fact, if you don't mind hitting the, the like button on this thing, I'd appreciate it. But um, I would like to figure out a way to mark these videos so that you know what they are instantly um, based on the title. And because I, I'm discovering that people say, well, I didn't realize there was going to be this kind of video. And for me, I usually look at the time and it says how long a video is. I'm like, okay, that's a big long discussion or it'll be something short and I know it's quick to the point. But I always start the live stream with the title, let's discuss dot, 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 whatever the topic is. And I figured that everyone would just learn that is a live stream video. And uh, because I never say, you know, let's discuss cyanobacteria when it's just a video about how to use phosphate, uh, red cyano RX. You know, that's gonna be a product video or a product review or a demonstration. But whenever I say let's discuss, that's live stream. So I was gonna suggest, or I was gonna ask you guys what you thought of, maybe I should just start the beginning of the title because there's only so much space you know, in the title bar when you're making a video and put LS for live stream, colon, and then the topic. I mean, would, do you feel that's even necessary or is that just like no big deal, whatever, forget it, don't even think about it? I'm always looking for ways to improve the channel and to make it uh, more easy to navigate is my question. So what do you suggest? I, I'm not doing special art. You don't see splashy cover screens or anything like that. But that being said, I am able to, after the fact, add a thumbnail. And maybe I could do some kind of a little icon. I don't know what. Something that represents the word live stream. A little thing in the corner. A little piece of art. I don't know. I, I try to keep things as simple as possible. Because the more complicated it becomes, the less likely I want to keep doing it. <laughs> can you believe that? So I try to, you know, if I can just do a live stream and then it uploads to YouTube, that's fantastic. And I don't have to go in and edit or do anything. That's great. And then when I focus on my, my full on edits, you know, and I spend a lot of time at the computer, you know, I dress it up and make it pretty. If and when I buy the new um, computer, whether it's a new MacBook Pro or I go into the God forbid PC world again <laughs> to get a much better processor, then I can use some software like OBS for the live streams and I can drop video into it and I can put cover slides into it and I can do all this cool switching. I, I also feel at that point when we've gone to that point with this channel, I will have to have a minion here on site. And so as I'm filming and answering questions, they will be helping me by pushing the slide to the screen, showing the subject I'm talking about. Uh, and by subject, I mean a picture of the actual critter. Uh, or they would be able to highlight, here's the question you need to answer next. 
which would be fantastic. I would love that because I kind of feel bad when you're waiting for me to find the next question when I have to get up to the screen and go look at the tiny words, like right now. I see people talking about bubble tip and enemy bubbles. And yeah, there is a big debate about it. And to this day, I still don't think anyone knows the real answer why some have it and some don't. All right, we are down to the last three minutes. If you have a question you want, to answer, you want answered today, now is your chance to type it in. And if I missed it earlier, I'm going to snip it out of this thing. I'm going to do a video. And it's going to be up on Facebook in an hour and a half. Okay, Big Salty says, I've read a lot about keeping alkalinity low when running a low nutrient system and with carbon dosing, but my alkalinity is 9.6 to 10 and my corals have taken off with new growth. Should I roll with it or should I lower my alkalinity? Years ago, when we first started reaching into the low nutrient environment, we did discover that tips of SPS corals were burning and we found that by lowering the alkalinity of the water, that seemed to prevent that problem. But as you just pointed out, in your tank, you're seeing phenomenal growth. I wouldn't mess with it. Just like I was talking about this on my tank, you know, what, 30 minutes ago, my nitrates have always been up. My corals continue to grow and look beautiful. Why am I so worried about lowering the nitrate? I just don't want them to go any higher. <laughs> but I would like them a little lower. I think that maybe I get a little bit more color out of my corals. But, uh, you know, I have to be realistic, too. You know, I'm not making a painting. This is a living biotope. There are creatures that have been in here with me for years. These clownfish right here, when did I get them? Three years ago? Spock, the big Nasso, I've had her since 2004. She's 14 going on 15 years old in my possession. So if I do some weird chemical change and I lose these guys, these pets of mine, I'd feel really bad. So look at your corals. If you're seeing the burnt tips, yeah, you probably need to lower your alkalinity. And by lower it, I don't mean like, okay, today it's 10, tomorrow it's 7. <laughs> you want to taper it down gradually and get it down to that lower number. But uh, like I said with my own tank, right now my tank's running right around 10. Uh, I think it was 10.5. Uh, hang on. Let me grab my notes here off the floor. They fell down. 11. Here are my parameters. 11 DKH. And uh, I'd say a week and a half ago they were around 8.5. So it actually went up quite a bit. But I just had refilled the calcium reactor. I expected that to happen. And uh, I missed one test period in that 10 period in that 10 day period. So I made a slight adjustment on my end to help it not go any higher than that. You know, I'm at 11. I'd rather be somewhere around 10 when I leave town. Uh, brown jelly is a totally different thing. And I've talked about it in my last stream, if I remember correctly. Someone asked me, what is your topic at Macna? Ooh, good question. Good way to end this live stream. So my topic is how to set up a saltwater aquarium the right way. <clears throat> and the whole point of that title was not to say that people do it the wrong way. But rather, I was trying to imply with a phrase we're trying to set up the right way for success. In other words, you know, so you avoid some of those common pitfalls that might happen with someone that's new. And it really is a newbie-centric topic. So, of course, everyone's welcome to attend. And, you know, if you've been in the hobby a long time, I hope I will share something that you find useful that you hadn't thought about before. But if you're new to the hobby and you're wanting, you know, some, uh, some good foundation knowledge, that's what my topic is about, how to set it up, what are the things to consider, and how to be successful so that way your first tank is awesome. And uh, I hope that I give you all the nuggets of truth that you need so that you can be successful. Uh, the last few years, Bulk Reef Supply has filmed or sponsored the filming of all the, video, of all the presentations. And odds are that's happening again this year. And if it does, then my presentation will end up on YouTube in a few months. But um, I'd much rather you come in person and be in the room. It's on Friday. My talk is at 1230, so just after lunch. And it lasts until 1.15. So I got to talk fast. It's faster than my live stream. <laughs> All right, guys. I think I'm just going to end it here. Um, next weekend, no live stream because I'm at Macna. 
if I can get a signal from the building to do anything live, I'll try it, but my, uh, I doubt it's gonna work. I really do, I, I really think it's not gonna work. I had looked into buying some very specific equipment to do a live stream on my own dedicated signal, and that project was looking at like $3,000 <laughs> to have what I, the technology I would need. So I'm not spending $3,000 for a live stream. Uh, that's not happening this year. Maybe next year I'll have enough money for that kind of insanity. But um, I will be filming at the show. There will be a video dropping in the middle of next week as well before I leave town because uh, I've been promising you guys videos. And so there's another one on the edit. The next video you'll find will be on Facebook where I answer some questions I missed today. So facebook.com slash me loves reef. Uh, do your water testing today. Clean your skimmer collection cups today. If you uh, have been kind of ignoring your skimmer and that cup is kind of full, empty it right this minute before it decides to just bloop overflow and send all that crap back into your tank. We want to make sure that's out of the tank. Clean your skimmers. Clean the, clean the collection cup. Clean the riser neck of the body of the skimmer so that way it's working efficiently. Do your water tests. Make sure that you're adjusting everything so it's perfect. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. Bye, guys.